Hello, my name's Hayley Herridge. Um, I'm Conservation Officer at Bug Life. Very warm welcome to this introduction to pollinator identification brought to you from the Giving Nature a Home project in Cardiff. The project is a partnership delivered by RSPB Cymru, Cardiff Council Community Ranger Service and Bug Life Cymru. And the project aims to engage local communities and families across Cardiff with nature and empower them to act for wildlife. And we've been very kindly funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. This workshop aims to raise awareness of the importance and the diversity of pollinating insects and provide tips on how to identify the different pollinating insect groups in the field. It really is a starting point for people interested in pollinate, uh, pollinating insects in terms of identification. And what we're going to be giving you today is the skills in order to go out in the field and distinguish one insect group from another. So for you to familiarise yourself with those key features that enable you to do that. It, also really good for anyone that's interested in, in carrying out the UK Pollinator Monitoring Scheme Flower Insect Time Counts, which is a, a fairly new citizen science set up to um, record abundance of flower insect, um, flower visiting insects. So what did invertebrates ever do for us? I always just think that that question is so vast, isn't it? That, you know, an entire talk or kind of someone's lifetime work could be around that alone. Um, there are over 40,000 invertebrate, invertebrate species in the UK performing a number of vital free services. So we're going to be looking at those that provide, you know, a pollination service to us. But there's also seed dispersal, sort of aeration of soil. So that's the sort of, you know, the worms. Um, creating gaps within the soil uh, decomposition. So things like flies feeding on rotting kind of flesh, where would we be without that? Nutrient cycling, you know, sort of again, like, you know, worms taking organic matter down into the soil and kind of enriching the soil. Control of pest species such as wasps predating aphids, um, food for us and other animals and indicating environmental health. So particularly like aquatic invertebrates are really good at informing us how clean and healthy our waters are. Insect pollination is absolutely essential to human food production and the wider ecosystem function. So let's just focus on that ecosystem bit for start with. 85% of wildflowers are dependent on insects for their pollination service. And many of our crops are dependent on insects for pollination. And it's worth around 690 million per annum um, to the UK, that service that insects provide. And, you know, by having insect pollinators pollinating the, the crops, you are likely to be increasing yields, quality and markability of crops. Now, unfortunately, there are some staggering declines in our UK pollinators. Over a third of bumblebee species have declined by 70%. 56 moth species have gone extinct since 1914. And 76% uh, of butterfly species have declined over the past 40 years. So why is this happening? It's due to a number of factors. The most significant cause of declines is the loss and degradation of habitats which provide food, shelter and nesting for pollinators. We've lost 97% of our flower rich grasslands, the equivalent of over 3 million hectares since the 1930s. And what is now left is kind of fragmented and isolated, um, leading to insect populations not being able to um, move across the landscape with ease. We also have the, the, the multiple pesticide and herbicides used in agriculture and horticulture, uh, which often have far reaching consequences for invertebrates beyond the kind of simple target species. Neonicotinoid pesticides have been shown to be toxic um, to, to bees and aquatic invertebrates and even birds. Diseases and parasites are also a kind of, of kind of an issue and, and and really, there's a lot more to be to be known in this kind of area about the true impact of commercially reared bumblebees and honeybees 
that can escape from the wild, uh, sorry, escape from, um, you know, glass houses into the wild, taking with them various diseases. And then finally, sort of on, on top of all that, we have climate change and the, the, the various ways that that is impacting um, our native pollinators. So pollinators are becoming decoupled from their associated plants, kind of emerging before or after flowering time. Um, we're, we're then getting um, the changes in climatic conditions leading to pollinators needing to move further north to find conditions suitable um, for, for them to survive and freak weather um, occurring as well at you know odd times a year so we're getting really really mild winters we're, we're getting you know kind of periods of extreme flooding or you know drought within spring which all sort of is impacting on the kind of the health of pollinator populations so what is pollination? Where well, it's the movement of pollen from one flower to another, enabling fertilisation and seed production. It can be abiotic, so um, things can be pollinated by wind or by water, but the majority of pollination involves an animal vector, with insects being the biggest group. So what are pollinators? Well, we consider them to be insects that are flower visitors. Um, and are known to or likely to carry pollen between flowers. The Stephen Falk estimates that there is around 6,000 species that are regularly visiting flowers and therefore we can consider pollinators. And of the 4,000 beetles, around 250 species are known to visit flowers. Of the 500 sawflies, less is known about sawflies, but around 250 potentially visit flowers. Of the 7,000 flies, 1,500 are considered to be pollinators. Of the moths and butterflies, if we group them together, there's about 1,500 species that are known to visit flowers. And of the 9,000 wasps, about 2,000 of them visit flowers. And then all the bees, um, so all 270 plus bees in the UK um, are pollinators. Our most significant pollinators in the UK belong to three insect orders, all winged insects. The most important order is Hymenoptera, which includes bumblebees, solitary bees and the honeybee. Now, these are all really sort of commercially significant groups, and that's mainly because bees are purposely visiting flowers to collect pollen in which they take back to the nest to feed their developing young. And for that reason, they are the most effective pollinators. We also have diptera, so that's our flies and hoverflies, but not limited to hoverflies, are really important pollinators. So there's lots and lots of flies that are visiting flowers. Um, and then finally, we have lepidoptera, which includes moths and butterflies. These are less commercially significant, but really important pollinators of wildflowers. All insects have three parts of their body. They have a head, thorax and abdomen and they have three pairs of legs, okay? And they usually have wings, either one or two pairs, but not always. Bees belong to the order Hymenoptera, meaning membrous wings. And also within this order, we have the wasps, ants, and sawflies. All bees are considered pollinators, so they, they're all visiting flowers to get nectar for energy. Um, and the females are collecting protein rich pollen which to take back to the nest to feed their developing young. Um, bees have a proboscis which is modified to allow them to collect nectar so to, to suck it up from plants um, and the females have the ability to carry large pollen loads back to the nest. They also and this is sort of this applies to females have a modified egg laying tube in which they can um, sting so it's only the females that can sting not the males because they don't have these egg laying tubes. Um, there's incredible diversity within the UK um, bees. They have different nesting preferences, food preferences, mating habits, habitat requirements, and they can look really different in appearance as you'll kind of see over the next couple of slides. There's 270 species in the UK, 
Only one of those is a honeybee, Apis mellifera, which we sort of tend to think of as domesticated um, and you tend to find living in hives and cared for by some human. Um, there's also 24 species of bumblebee and 250 or so species of solitary bee. And that number's kind of changing as we discover new species arriving from the continent. So I'm going to begin by starting with the um, probably one of the most popular bees in the whole world, the, the honeybee. Um, these two photos are of the, the Western or sometimes known as the European honeybee, so Apis mellifera. And I should say that there's several subspecies of Apis mellifera. Um, but around the world, there are other species of honeybee and they all come under the genus Apis. Um, they're quite easily distinguishable and some key ID features are the pollen baskets. So you, if you look at the photo on the left here, you can see um, at the top of the leg, you have this flattened segment and that is known as a pollen basket. And you will find those on the hind legs of females only. So um, in the case of honeybees on the honeybee workers. Um, also another key characteristic that you can look out for is below the, the honey, um, sorry, the pollen basket on the back leg is a flattened, another flattened segment. And only honeybees have this. So when you're looking at a bee in the field, if you're not sure whether it's a honeybee or whether it might be a um, large solitary bee, look for that flattened segment below the um, pollen basket. That's a really good thing to look out for. They also have hairy eyes and although you may not be able to see that in this photograph, once you get your eye in in the field, you can actually see the hairs on their eyes and there's no other bees in the UK that have hairy eyes. So here we go, we've got a nice example here of pollen basket. So you can see we've got that flat shiny area surrounded by long hairs, those are known as corbicular hairs, situated on the hind leg of a female and it's used as a means of transporting pollen back to the nest. And then we have this flattened segment below the pollen basket, um, of which honeybees have, but other bees don't, that carry pollen. So that's a really good um, characteristic to look out for. Apart from bumblebees, which are also social insects, this is a very different to most, um, this is a very different way of collecting pollen to um, other bee genera in the um, in the UK, which usually carry pollen in fairy pollen brushes or on the underside of their bodies. Uh, this picture demonstrates those hairy eyes. So as you can see, quite visible there. Um, you can also see the pollen basket. You can also note the antennae and I don't know if you can really see the proboscis in this image, but the mandibles you can clearly see in the photo on the top right there. So those are the biting jaws of the bee. Um, that's a good thing to note as well when you're kind of looking at insects out in the field is all these little individual characteristics that um, separate one insect group from another. Here we have the bumblebees, a really easily recognisable group and a good place to start if you're learning how to identify bees. They belong to the bom uh, genus Bombus and there's 24 species in total in the UK. And here we have uh, some of the most common seven species. They are characterised by these large, densely furry bodies. Some of them have colour bands. Some of them have different tail colours and some are even entirely ginger like this uh, common card bee here we see in the top centre. Bumblebees like honeybees are social. They form nesting colonies from a few dozen workers to several hundred and they utilise spaces such as small mammal burrows, sort of redundant small mammal burrows I should say, grass tussocks or even in bird boxes and um, people have been known to find red-tailed bumblebees nesting in kind of old mowers and sheds or under sheds or in wood piles so you can find them in a few different places. They have an annual life cycle involving this mass provisioning of pollen for the nest to feed their young and they also um, collect nectar and take it back to the nest, but they only store it in a very, very small scale, unlike honeybees. So if we have a look here, we've got a, a tree bumblebee on the top left. 
So this species has a ginger thorax, black abdomen and a white tail. Top centre we have the common cardabee, so this is an all ginger species, um, but it does tend to have a few sort of dark hairs on the abdomen and they can kind of vary a bit in colour. On the top right we have the red tail bumblebee, this is entirely black with a red tail. Then the bottom left we have the buff tail bumblebee. So in early spring, these are the species, the, or the queens, sorry, of the species tend to be the bees that you see flying around first of all at the very beginning of spring. Um, and it has a, gin, a buff tailed buff tail and two um, bands across the body, one across the top of the thorax and one across the top of the abdomen. The white tail bumblebee is very similar, but it has a white tail, not a buff tail, which is very easily recognisable when you're looking at queens. Um, and again, it has a, a band across the top of the abdomen and top of the thorax. Then we have the garden bumblebee. So this actually has three yellow bands across the body. It has one across the top of the thorax, one across the bottom of the thorax, and one across the top of the abdomen and a white tail. And when you see this flying around, sometimes it's quite hard to notice those those two yellow bands across the centre of the body. They look like one band. So you just have to look out for that. This species has the longest tongue of all, and you tend to see it foraging on things like foxglove and honeysuckle. So it's a good one to kind of note. And then in the bottom right hand corner, the early bumblebee, which is one of the smaller bumblebees. It has two yellow bands, one across the top of the thorax, one across the top of the abdomen and an orangey red tail and it is kind of the sort of the tip of the tail um, that is that is orange so you have to kind of look out for that sometimes you can kind of miss the colour on the tip of the tail in this species so as well as bumblebees being recognised by their furry bodies also another key um, ID feature is the back legs so the uh, females, queens and workers, collect pollen, just like the worker honeybee, and they have these flattened uh, surfaces on their back legs known as pollen baskets, um, fringed with these long um, hairs known as corbicular hairs. Males don't collect pollen in, um, to take back to the nest, so they don't have pollen baskets. They do have kind of almost like false looking pollen baskets. They have kind of shiny area on the on the um, hind tibia on the back of the leg, but they have um, inter the, the, but that area will be interspersed with with fine hairs. Now, of the 24 bumblebees, six are actually kleptoparasites. Um, and we call these cuckoos. So very similar to a cuckoo bird, the cuckoos will seek out um, a nest of a host species. They will usurp the queen or kill the queen and then they lay eggs in the nest and the workers of that nest will rear her young um, as their own. Now cuckoos have evolved from sort of social species like a, like a, a true true um, bumblebee species um, but over time they have formed dense hairs over where their pollen baskets once were so in the field when you're looking at bumblebees it is really important to look at the back legs to help you determine first of all whether um, the bee is actually in fact a bumblebee then whether it's female or male or in fact a cuckoo Solitary bees. Now there's over 250 species of solitary bee in the UK and they're the kind of unsung heroes I think really because not many people realise that there are such things as solitary bees and that there are so many species and there's incredible um, diversity within um, within solitary bees. They're absolutely fascinating um, and you can see from these images here that they vary greatly in their appearance. Some are quite wasp-like, you know, some superficially look like small bumblebees um, and some are kind of hairier than others. So they vary greatly in their appearance, but also in their behaviour as well. Um, they they use um, a variety of different nesting um, habitats and some are very uh, sort of niche and associated with particular plants and particular habitats and others are more um, 
broadly found, a, a widespread and um, commonly found kind of in gardens, um, urban areas, as well as kind of rural. So how do you know when you're in the field, whether you're looking at a social bee or a solitary bee? Well, one key thing to, you can look at are the, um, the back legs again. Solitary bees um, work as individuals uh, for the most part. So the female will uh, seek out an, a nest site and provision that nest with pollen, lay her eggs, seal the nest. She doesn't rear her own like social bees do um, and she sort of works alone and they, they collect pollen in, in different ways. They collect them in pollen brushes. And the, this is a sort of a dense mass of elongated, often branched hairs, um, good for capturing pollen. And these are located either on the back legs or the underside of the abdomen. And it's only the females that are collecting pollen, not the males. So if you see a bee in the field and you note it's got really clear pollen baskets, then you've got a bumblebee or a honeybee. If it doesn't have pollen baskets, um, then it's a solitary bee. So here we have an example of the, the different ways that solitary bees um, collect pollen, two different types of pollen brushes. Here on the left, we have a leaf cutter bee. Leaf cutters have thick bristly hairs on the underside of their abdomen known as scopa, and they pack the pollen in between these hairs. And then on the right here, we've got an Andrina species. So this is a ground nesting bee and it's collecting pollen on its back legs in between thick bristly hairs. Now, when I'm teaching people in the field, one of the first things I always get someone to do when they have have an insect in a pot, um, particularly when we're kind of looking at identifying bees, is to get them to, first of all, just double check that it is in fact a bee, because there are many flies out there that look like bees and you can quite easily mistake them. So let's have a look at some of the key differences here. So flies only have one pair of wings. OK, whereas bees have two pairs of wings. Now, you can see here um, in the image of the solitary bee that there are two wings. The second pair of wings, the kind of the underwings, can often be go mistaken because they actually hook on to the forewing. So that's something to look out for. The other key difference is the eyes okay so bees have these eyes small eyes with sort of elongated eyes on the side of their heads and then flies have these huge great big eyes which take up kind of almost the top of the head and sometimes they're either completely joined or they have a small gap in between them and then there's the antennae okay so bees have long antennae whereas flies have these kind of short uh, clubbed antennae. So if you have a bee in your pot or you're looking at a bee in your garden or on your walk, let's just recap on what the key differences are here between bumblebees and solitary bees. Bumblebees are generally larger, they're more densely hairy. You can see this example here of a white-tailed bumblebee. It has a colour band across the top of the thorax, across the abdomen, and a white tail and very clearly here you can see that it's female because it has a pollen basket. If you look at the solitary bee on the left, this particular species, the hairy footed flower bee, does look quite similar to a bumblebee but it's generally smaller uh, with um, and they often have kind of little or um, no body hairs and um, this is probably one of the most furriest of the solitary bees. It also has a pollen brush present on the hind leg um, and this species has bright ginger hairs on the back leg. So again, when you look at it at first glance, you can think, oh, it's got a full pollen load, but actually it's a hairs, it's not a pollen basket. So that's a key difference. Another large group within the order Hymenoptera are the wasps, around 9,000 species in the UK. So we have nine social species, and those are the ones that you can see here in the image on the right that we're kind of very familiar with. Um, then there's 250 species of solitary wasp, 
500 plus sawflies, and we'll talk about those later, 2,500 ichneumon wasps, so these are quite distinctive as well, and then 6,000 plus species of parasitic wasp, um, and many of those are tiny, and you'd probably mistake them for flies. Um, key difference, though, between bees and wasps is that wasps provide animal food to their young. Um, in the form of insects such as spiders and, and soft, soft bodied um, bugs and things. Wasps as adults feed on pollen and nectar and uh, therefore are considered pollinators and around 2,500 wasp species are pollinators. So wasps haven't evolved their physiological features to carry pollen. Under a microscope, it's quite easy to identify bees from wasps because bees have branched hairs. They've evolved to collect pollen and those hairs are branched in order to help the pollen stick to their bodies. Wasps don't collect pollen and their hairs are straight. However, in their field, you can't see this really um, easily kind of identifiable feature. So we have to look at other things. So wasps are generally much less hairy than bees and they don't have those those pollen baskets and here we have an example of a social wasp and they're really easy identified by their kind of the coloration of their bodies by the patterns by that black and yellow pattern that we're so familiar with we're probably less familiar with solitary wasps and solitary wasps often their heads are larger and more rectangular they have no obvious body hairs and no pollen brush. And they can often be slender, sometimes brilliant metallic, black, black and yellow, um, black and red. And sometimes they have very long ovipositors, which is a modified egg laying tube. And they vary greatly in size. By comparison, we have the sort to be here with those, the hairy body and the pollen brushes present on the hind legs. So here we have an example of a few British wasps. This really demonstrates the uh, diversity in terms of their appearance. Um, we have the ruby tail wasp on the top left, also sometimes known as a dual wasp. Brilliant metallic body. This is a cuckoo species um, and parasitizes other wasp species. So it can often be seen investigating holes of, of its host. Um, feeds on flowers, so you can often see it um, on flowers too. Ornate tailed digger wasp. Now this is another solitary uh, wasp species. This um, preys on other um, amphipods such as uh, bees and bugs and spiders and beetles. They nest in the ground. I often see them walking along footpaths. You can see them digging out their holes. Really attractive, kind of easily identifiable. Then we have the ichneumon wasp. So this is a huge group, 2,500 um, species. They're large parasitoid wasps with long antennae, so at least 16 segments. Females often have a really long ovipositor in which to lay eggs inside the larvae of various um, insects. Um, males can look quite different to females. And then finally, we have the uh, spider hunting wasp here. So spider hunting wasps prey on spiders, taking them back to the nest to feed their larvae. Um, and they often have slender black or slender black and red abdomens and, and long legs. So the nine species of social wasp in the UK. So known for being a bit of a nuisance late summer, but generally less well known for the important role they play preying on pest species on our crops. So if you can look past the sometimes kind of painful inconvenience they cause, they really are amazing. We have two species that are um, very common and create quite large colonies. So that's Vespula vulgaris and Vespula germanica. So that's the common wasp and the um, German wasp. And, and then we have other species which create kind of smaller colonies and can be quite specific to certain habitats like woodland habitats that we're probably less kind of familiar with seeing. But they, they're all very easily identifiable by these kind of black or brown and yellow bodies. And here we can see um, 
actually quite classically you can see here on the wasp that has its head in the ground that nipped in wasp like waist and that's quite key to identifying wasps um, from sawflies and we're, we're going on to look at sawflies in a minute but you can also see here actually that this wasp has folded wings and, and that's quite a key feature of um, social wasp species. So here we have an example of a sawfly. Um, sawflies aren't actually flies, they're very closely related to wasps and bees. They are the most primitive group within the order Hymenoptera, um, which also includes ants, but they form their own suborder known as Symphyta. They differ from bees, wasps and ants due to the lack of nipped in waist. OK, so they have quite a thick waist. Um, and their wing venations as well kind of are different. You can see here this wing is quite crumpled and it also has this kind of like dark markings in the centre. Um, and venations, I should say, are those rod like kind of struts that support the kind of flexibility of the wing membrane. Um, they have two pairs of wings, they're harmless, they cannot sting. Uh, you often see them um, flying. Active, sort of active during the day and um, they have kind of a weak flight. Females often have, um, or some females I should say, possess a saw like ovipositor, hence where they get their name from. And then larvae are quite caterpillar like and feed on specific plants. So it's worth having a look for, um, for the larvae in your garden actually. Sawflies have an amazing relationship with plants. Um, yeah, and Stephen Falk suspects around half the British species visit flowers, so can be considered pollinators as well. So the key differences between wasps and sawflies, wasps have a wasp like waist, OK, a sort of a nipped in waist that uh, joins the abdomen to the thorax, whereas sawflies have this thick waist. Um, sawflies can some some have quite stout bodies. The antennae varies as well. It can be um, wasp-like or it can even be clubbed or even feathered. And, and some are metallic um, and many actually, many sawflies are wasp mimics. But another key thing to note, I think, in the field is that they have a slower moving um, flight, quite a weak flight. So now we're going to move on to the order Diptera or the flies. Diptera comes from Greek, di meaning two and terra meaning wings, so they have one pair of wings. Diptera is the second largest order of insects after Hymenoptera. And we shouldn't forget about the flies. Often when we think of flies as pollinators, we think of hoverflies, but there are many, many other species visiting flowers and therefore important pollinators too. We have some examples here. So we have a soldier fly on the top left, really striking coloration, um, hence its name. We have a canopid fly on the top right, or also known as this group, also known as flick, thick, sorry, thick headed flies. They are parasitoid species, um, some mimic wasps, and they parasitize bumblebees, wasps, solitary bees. At the bottom right here, we have a bee fly. So you may be familiar with bee flies. They fly around in spring. You can often see them hovering over bare patches of ground outside the sort of the nest holes of solitary bees or feeding on primroses and early um, spring wildflowers. They can be mistaken for hoverflies, although they're, they're not a hoverfly, but they do hover around. They have a darting flight. They have this long proboscis. And they have these furry bodies, so they kind of they're mimicking bees, although they are a fly. Then we have a tenacid fly. These are parasitic flies, tend to have very bristly hairs on their bodies. And then a house fly. So house flies, um, very abundant group and have varying kind of colours from black to grey to metallic green and blue. There are around 7,000 species of fly in the UK, um, so they're a huge group. By comparison, there's just 275 plus species of bee. Um, as I said, they have one pair of wings, but actually they 
had a second pair, but over time that pair has evolved into kind of a flight balancing organs known as haltiers. So you have these kind of um, stalked knobs at the base of where the second pair of wings would have once been. They are very good flyers. Um, and many of them are important kind of pollinators. There's around 1500 species that are known to kind of visit um, flowers as adults. Uh, they are found in a wide variety of habitats and they have a wide range of feeding habits from predatory to um, parasitic, sorry, and some are scavengers, some are feeding on, um, you know, vegetation, on plant material, you know, bulbs, some feed on fungi, um, and some are feeding on, you know, deadwood and, and rotting kind of vegetation within um, water. But a really significant group of flies are the hoverflies belonging to the family uh, Surfidae. So we're going to take a closer look at them. 270 of the 283 uh, hoverfly species have been identified as important pollinators. So, as I kind of mentioned before, flies have short antennae. So they have three segments, which you can see here in the top image. Some hoverflies are mimicking bees and wasps through behaviour, appearance and sound. And wing venation is really important for identifying um, solitary bees. So again, those, those rod-like structures on the wings. So what makes a hoverfly a hoverfly? Well, in terms of identification, it comes down to the wing venation. So hoverflies have a false vein known as a vena spuria that runs through the wing and it's unique to hoverflies. You can see an example here in this photograph. You can also see here a false margin and this is another useful identification feature. Hoverflies are also fairly compact build. They never have very elongated bodies or long legs or proboscis, and their bodies don't tend to be bristly, um, furry, but never bristly like um, houseflies. And also, however much they look like wasps or bees, they never sting. So this is our most common hoverfly, the marmalade hoverfly, Epicerphus boltatus. It's a variable species in that the background colour of its abdomen can be influenced by the temperature at which the larvae develop. And this is really interesting. So if the larvae develop in hot conditions, adults produce more orange markings and sometimes the black can be almost entirely lacking. Um, and larvae that develop in cooler conditions produce darker adults. The larvae of this species feed on aphids, which can be numerous in agricultural crops. And this is a really strong migratory species that can be found at any time of year. Uh, it adults, the adults um, hibernate, so you will see it sort of popping out on warm days in winter. Peak abundance there is around July. And sometimes you get these mass migrations taking place from continental Europe. It's the only hoverfly with a double black marking on the abdomen and the second bar looks like a moustache. So it's really easy to identify this one. So some hoverflies are mimicking bees and wasps and we have some good examples here. This is a form of Batesia mimicry, which is where a harmless species which is um, palatable to a predator, mimics the appearance of a harmful noxious species for protection. So these guys are mimicking bees and wasps because they have the ability to sting and therefore predators will avoid eating them. So there are around 10 species of hoverfly that can be regarded as bumblebee mimics and about five or six that can be regarded as honeybee mimics. Um, and there are many other hoverflies that mimic solitary uh, bees and wasps in a kind of fairly general way. So we're now going to move on to the order Lepidoptera, of which the butterflies and moths belong to. Uh, butterflies and moths have two pairs of wings with scales, so Lepidoptera means scale wing. And they're easily recognisable and many are really sort of brightly coloured, um, beautiful insects. They have long antennae, as you can kind of see here, and a long proboscis for accessing nectar sores, but some adults don't feed. And larvae feed on plants and many species are, have a specific food plant. 
So we have 59 species of butterfly in the UK, 57 of those are resident and we have two regular migrants, the painted lady and the clouded yellow. By comparison, we have 2,500 species of moth and butterf between butterflies and moths, 1,500 species are considered pollinated, so, you know, visiting flowers. Adult moths and their caterpillars are a food for a wide variety of wildlife, and it's estimated that blue tits eat 50 billion moth caterpillars each year. So if you're wildlife gardening, you really want to think about providing those um, larval food plants for butterflies and moths in order to be providing food, you know, for other um, animals within the food chain. Butterflies can be distinguished from moths by the clubbed antennae. So you have an example here on the left. Moths antennae can vary though. They can be fine, they can be feathery. And you do get an exception to the rule with the burnet moths have clubbed antennae like butterflies. However, you can also look at other key ID features to help you determine whether you've got a butterfly and a moth. So butterflies, when they roost, their wings will be tightly together, held vertically, whereas moths roost with their wings held horizontally flat over their bodies. So this is as a general rule. There are exceptions. For example, the dingy skipper butterfly also rests in a moth-like um, pose. Um, and burnet moths have those clubs and tennies, I said, but they always rest in a moth-like pose. Butterflies also rarely fly at night um, and many will only fly in brilliant sunshine, whereas moths um, mainly fly at night, but there are also um, many day flying moths that are readily recognised as moths by their antennae and their resting posture. So we have some lovely examples here of some common butterflies in the UK. Um, on the top left, we have the painted lady. This is a migrant butterfly from North Africa. Um, it tends to arrive in the UK um, and gives rise to sort of second generation, but this generation is unable to survive winter. So each year the population is dependent on the migration and it feeds on thistles. And then we have the peacock butterfly, easily recognisable, one of the most stunning, I think, um, feeds on uh, nettles. And we have the speckled wood here on the top right. This is a woodland butterfly, often flies in kind of sun and dappled shade and feeds on various grasses, including Coxfoot, uh, Yorkshire, uh, Yorkshire fog and false broom. We then have our most common uh, blue butterfly. This is a small, stunning um, butterfly, feeds on bird's foot trefoil. Then we have the small tortoise shell, again, easily recognisable, and this also feeds on, on nettle, as well as uh, small nettle and hop. And then we have the red admiral, and the red admiral is also a um, migratory species. And the population in the UK is almost entirely dependent on the immigration from um, continental Europe. It sometimes hibernates as an adult and it kind of it feeds on nettles as well. So here we have some examples of day flying moths. So you can see these alongside butterflies uh, nectaring on flowers during the day. One of them, probably the most well known is the cinnabar moth on the top left, which feeds on ragwort. Um, larvae or caterpillars are really easy, recognisable kind of orange and black stripe. And it gets its name due to the colour of the hind wings, so the markings on the forewings, which are sort of unmistakable. Then we have the six spot burnet moth, it's a quite common um, moth you can find feeding on um, birds, but trefoil it has clubbed antennae like a butterfly, but it holds its wings um, when resting horizontally against the body like a moth. It's there are more than one species of burnet moth, um, and we also have a five spot burnet moth. So it is cares, you know, care does have to be taken with identification just to, to make sure that you, you get get that right. Then we have the silver Y, probably the most common um, migrant moth. <clears throat> Each of its forewings has this conspicuous kind of metallic silver Y marking which is where it gets its name from. Um, and it flies during the day, but also night and can be kind of observed flowering and um, nectaring on flowers. 
and it feeds on a wide variety of different plants, including uh, bedstraws and clovers and nettle and garden pea and even cabbage. We also have the uh, lace border. So this is a really pretty moth. This feeds on thyme and marjoram and tends to be found in calcareous uh, downland, um, also kind of disused railway embankments. Then we have the burnet companion. So this is a largely um, orange and yellow, it has largely sort of orange and yellow hind wings um, combined with those kind of brown uh, forewings and feeds on clovers and trefoils. And then finally, the um, hummingbird hawk moth, which is absolutely amazing. It looks like a little hummingbird, hovers while it's nectaring on plants. This is a, a migrant from southern Europe and it feeds on ladies' bed straw, as well as other plants as well. So now we move on to the order Coleoptera, the beetles, and Coleoptera means sheathed wings. I think that the beetles are really easy, recognisable group because they have these hardened uh, wing cases protecting uh, their abdomens. There are around 4,000 species in the UK in terrestrial and aquatic habitats. Only a small minority of those are considered pollinators. However, scientists believe that the very first flowering plants co-evolved with beetles as their pollination partners about 200 million years ago. Interestingly, of that 250 in the UK that act as pollinators, approximately half of that figure are considered saprocyclic. Um, and saprocyclic beetles or saprocyclic species are species that are dependent upon dead and decaying wood for part of their life cycle or feed upon those that are dependent on dead and decaying wood for part of their life cycle. So they're not efficient pollinators as they're not as hairy as, as bees. Um, and I've already mentioned the, the modified uh, wing cases or their elytra covering their hind wings. If they are present, they're not always, and they also have biting uh, mouth parts. So here we have an example of the elytra, so those hardened wing cases, often shiny, and you have that clear line down the centre of the abdomen that um, separates the two. So here we have some easily identifiable beetles that you're likely to see on uh, flowers. We have the seven spot ladybird, easily recognisable sort of red elytra with black spots, often found kind of on flowers in pursuit of aphids. We then have the red soldier beetle, often seen on open structure flowers such as umbellifers um, and can be found on really large numbers on hogweed. Adults feed on aphids as well as pollen and nectar. And the larvae uh, prey on ground dwelling and invertebrates such as slugs and snails, which live at the base of long grasses. Adults can spend much of their short summer lives mating and they're often seen on pairs on tops of flowers. Um, we then have pollen beetles, tiny black pollen beetles can be found in various types of flowers. These beetles eat pollen and sometimes the stamens or petals of flowers. And then we have the thick-legged, thick um, sorry, the swollen fide, or sometimes it's called thick-legged beetle, commonly seen on oxide daisies and other open structure flowers. And it's a common occurrence in gardens. Males have these thickened hind legs, um, so easily recognisable. Um, adults are also pollen feeders and larvae live in um, hollow plant stems. OK, now we've worked our way through all the different pollinating insect groups. It's now time for a quiz. So questions, put these insects into their correct groups. So bees, wasps, sawflies, flies, beetles, butterflies and moths. Name the insect group. If you want to have a go at this, then please pause the recording. I'm just going to run through the answers to this straight away. So A, we have a beetle, um, easily recognisable uh, by the shiny elytra, protecting the abdomen. B, we have a bee, so furry body, uh, you can see pollen brushes on the back legs, 
we can see long antennae and we can also see those uh, small eyes on the side of the head. C, we have a butterfly. Uh, we can make this out by looking at the clubbed antennae or noting the clubbed antennae, I should say, and also the way that it's holding its wings kind of um, horrors, uh, sorry, vertically. D, we have a fly, so one pair of wings, uh, large eyes on the top of the head. Uh, this one is mimicking a bee, so it has a densely furry body and pointed proboscis. E is a hornet. Um, so this is a social wasp species and you can quite clearly see it's got that, that yellow, um, in this case, brown markings. Again, uh, long antennae and eyes at the side of the head, but no pollen baskets present. And also folded wings should note those as well, uh, which is a feature of the social wasps. And then finally, F, this is our sawfly. So we can very clearly see here, no nipped in waist, a nice thick, thick waisted um, insect. And you can also note interesting kind of wing venations here. And two pairs of wings, you should also note, um, making it not a fly. Finally, I just wanted to bring your attention to the UK Pollinator Monitoring Scheme Flower Insect Time Counts, known as the POMS FIT Counts. It's a fairly new citizen science set up in um, 2017 by the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and it's tracking the changes in abundance of flower visiting insects over time. Um, it's great because it's recording abundance of all pollinators, not just sort of bees or hoverflies, for example. It's fairly straightforward um, for, for, for people, for, for children, they may need some support. It takes only 10 minutes of time and you observe a target plant in flower um, and you record all the insect groups visiting those flowers within that, within that time period. And it's just a simple tally of the insect group. So you're not going down to species unless you want to. And this is something that you can do anywhere, whether it's your garden or whether it's a nature reserve. And actually, I think that DEH would really like people to um, gather data over time for, for a particular site. So it's something that can be repeated on the same site throughout the year, looking at different flowers, um, depending on what's in flower at the time. Um, so I'd highly recommend having a go at this. Um, yeah, and it, it is straightforward, but yes, as I said, you would probably need to support children in, in doing this. OK, and that's the end of the workshop. I hope that's been really helpful. Um, please get in touch with Bob Life if you have any questions. And there's lots more information can be found on the Giving Nature Home project in Cardiff website.